The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. The last forever No is full And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ the rock is my foundation I will trust in Him I will trust in Him Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, pastor is an acrostic which stands for preaching all salvation through one Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode series, our goal is to fully equip ourselves with a complete historical and cultural understanding of Jesus's I am statements as revealed within God's Word, the Bible. While the subject matter may not be completely new ground, I have an abiding faith that any time we approach God's Word with a sincere and earnest desire to learn, we cannot help and will not fail to deepen a greater understanding and appreciation of God's nature and deity from a diligent Berean study of His Word, the Bible. In the previous four episodes, we began a journey to deepen our understanding of Jesus' I Am statements found within the New Testament. It is my contention that these various statements, when viewed properly, clearly draw a straight line identifying Jesus' divinity and recognition as the God of the Bible, the God of all creation, the Lord of life, and the King of kings. In episodes 1 and 2, we completed a search of Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, along with a survey of the Old Testament in Hebrew, as well as the Septuagint Greek regarding God's revelation to Moses and by extension to his people of God's character or name. In part three, we began our survey in earnest with a study of Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, and Luke chapter 22 regarding Jesus' I Am statements under oath to the high priest during his trial. In part four, we looked at Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in John 4. In part five, we began to look at Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 and his walking on the water of the Sea of Galilee. 
In part 6, we continue to examine John 6, where Jesus and his disciples land at Capernaum, where Jesus repeatedly says, I am the bread of life. In part 7, we took a side road and looked at John 7, where Jesus used the event of the Feast of Tabernacles and the water drawing ceremony to proclaim that he was Messiah and to invite believers, saying, quote, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, unquote. In this episode, we continue with John chapter 8 and its subject matter appear to be connected with the same timeline as our previous episode discussing John 7 and the water drawing ceremony. After Jesus' statement saying, quote, He that believeth on me, as scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, unquote. An argument then breaks out between the Pharisees and Nicodemus. Jesus leaves the scene, and in verse 1 of chapter 8, we find out where Jesus goes. Quote, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, unquote. In verse 2, we learn that Jesus returns to the temple. Quote, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them, unquote. As the remainder of chapter 8 unfolds, it is clear that the context of what is being discussed provides yet another additional type and its corresponding substance revolving around another Jewish cultural and historical ceremony. The ceremony which we will be looking at takes place at the same time during the Feast of Tabernacles previously discussed. The main subject of the ceremony will in this case highlight one of Jesus' I Am statements. Chapter 8 also provides opportunity to take a detour, stop, and enjoy smelling a wonderful rose with details often missed. Let's begin our tour with verse 3. Quote, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself up, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Unquote. Now, I know that I am not the only one who has read this story and wondered what was it that Jesus wrote. Think of it. If you do not realize it, there are only three times Scripture records God actually writing. The first time being when God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on the tablets of stone. The second time when God wrote on the wall in the presence of Belshazzar. And finally, here, Jesus, who is God, writes on the ground with his finger. 
We know what he wrote in the first two instances, but what did he write here? Well, let's do a little detective work and see if we can shed some light on it. To begin with, let's recall that Jesus is here, sitting inside the temple, teaching the people. While doing so, the scribes and the Pharisees who know Jesus is there decide to test Jesus and to trap him. In this case, the Pharisees and scribes are somehow able to find a woman who was in the act of committing adultery. They essentially arrest the woman and take her to Jesus, informing him that the woman had violated the law by engaging in adultery. The Pharisees and scribes then proceed to tell Jesus about the Mosaic law which required that those who were guilty of adultery should be stoned. The Pharisees and scribes, having interrupted Jesus' teaching, ask him what he thinks should happen. Now, as we examine this incident, the first thing to notice is that the Pharisees and scribes, who are the supposed experts in the law presume to quote the law to Jesus, who in fact is God and in who in fact wrote the law. In this case, the law regarding adultery, which they refer to, is found in Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10 and Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 22, which says, quote, and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death." Unquote. Based upon this, we immediately see that the Pharisees and the scribes who held themselves out to be the authorities of all Mosaic law, were in fact here themselves violating the law, according to both the written and the oral law, both the adulteress, i.e. the woman, and the adulterer, i.e. the man, were supposed to be tried, and if found guilty, put to death by the Pharisees and scribes own testimony the woman was caught in the very act of adultery if that was the case then by definition the man i.e. the adulterer also had to be there and was also caught in the very act so why was the man, i.e. the adulterer, not arrested and brought to Jesus? We know via John's record that the motive for the Pharisees and scribes was to tempt Jesus so that they could accuse him, and apparently their animosity and zeal to do so was so great that they were willing to violate the law themselves. In any case, moving forward, the key to understanding the rest of the account lies within a search of the Jewish historical customs surrounding the Mosaic Law and the crime of adultery. If we do so, we learn that those accused of adultery were supposed to be brought before the high priest. Secondly, by the time of the Second Temple period, those charged with adultery were brought to the Nicanor Gate, or Beautiful Gate, which is between the Court of the Women and the Court of the Gentiles. John's account here does not tell us precisely where within the Temple Jesus was seated teaching when the Pharisees and scribes brought this woman, what is clear is that by bringing this woman to Jesus, the Pharisees and scribes were clearly placing Jesus into the role of the high priest. This is significant since we know that Jesus is our better high priest according to Hebrews. 
since the Pharisees and scribes were accepting Jesus as the high priest and asking him to judge a case of adultery, it would perhaps be completely logical to believe that Jesus was in fact sitting at or near the Nicanor Gate, and this was what prompted the Pharisees and scribes to contemplate this scheme to entrap Jesus to begin with regarding this subject. The second thing we find historically is that the priest was required to then stoop down and write the law that had been allegedly broken along with the name of the accused in the dust of the floor of the temple or anywhere else as long as the marks were not permanent. During the time Jesus was writing on the ground, Jesus stands briefly and addresses the Pharisees and scribes, saying, quote, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her, unquote. Jesus then stoops and resumes writing on the ground. Given the fact the Pharisees and scribes had themselves violated the law and were attempting to be witnesses, Jesus' statement could very well infer that Jesus was writing the names and various sins which the Pharisees and scribes had each themselves committed. This would then explain why, after Jesus makes this challenge, we read that the Pharisees and scribes were, quote, convicted by their own conscience, unquote, and as a result, they left leaving Jesus and the woman alone. By another coincidence, any serious Pharisee and or scribe would have yearly heard the high priest recite Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 13 at the conclusion of Yom Kippur. Jeremiah 17 verse 13 says, quote, O Yahweh, the immerser of Israel, all those who leave your way shall be put to shame. Those who turn aside from my ways will have their names written in the dust and blotted out, for they have departed from Yahweh, the fountain of the waters of life." Unquote. So whether or not, in fact, the words of Jeremiah were ringing in the Pharisees and scribes' hearts as Jesus' words and actions sent them packing, we are not told. But the fact remains that many who saw and hear Jesus and his ministry wound up departing from Jesus, who was Yahweh in the flesh. Even so, many then and now have their names written in the dust because they will not repent and turn to Jesus as the water of life and their names will be blotted out. Now, before we move on to verse 12, we need to examine another Jewish festival in order to provide context. During the same seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, which we have just discussed previously, there was a ceremony known as the Illumination of the Temple, or the Temple Lighting Ceremony. During the Feast of Tabernacles, there were four 70-foot-high menorahs or candelabras inside the court of the women. On each night of the seven days of the feast, young men would climb the ladders leading to the menorahs containing many gallons of oil. These lamps were lit in the temple at night and were so bright that it is said to have illuminated the entire city of Jerusalem. The significance of the lamps and their light was, were to remind Israel of the pillar of fire that had led them in the wilderness journey, as well as God's Shekinah glory which once filled the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple. 
the light and the ceremony was also a reminder that God had promised to send a light to renew Israel's glory and release them from bondage and restore their joy. It is likely that the celebration also took its source authority from two passages in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16, quote, And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things I will do unto them, and not forsake them." Unquote. Also, Isaiah 49, chapter 6, quote, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth." Unquote. So, once again, reading these passages, it's easy to see how the light mentioned in both points ultimately to Jesus, who is God as the substance for which the light of the temple lighting ceremony stood. Then and presently, Jesus, who is God, is the light of that temple, which is in heaven as he sits on the throne. But ultimately, the Jews, as all God's elect, look forward to a day when Jesus sits as King of kings and Lord of lords on the throne of both heaven and earth and gives his light to a restored world where there is no more darkness, sin, sickness, or death. It is within the context of these events of the temple lighting ceremony where the last day of the ceremony is concluded. Everyone's thoughts would be directed to the lights of the giant menorahs which were about to be extinguished until next year. Or perhaps they had just been extinguished and the crowd was feeling somewhat quietly nostalgic. It is at this point that Jesus, who is still in the temple and is witness to the lights, says the following in verse 12, quote, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life, unquote. Again, Jesus connects the typological dots, saying, quote, I am, unquote, ego I may, the existing one, the one who is, the I will exist before I will exist, I exist because I exist, I am who I am, I am that I am, I will be who I will be, or I am that which exists, I am the pillar of fire. I am God's Shekinah glory in the flesh. I am the one who was in the burning bush. I am the one who will renew Israel's glory, release them from bondage, and restore their joy. I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. To this, the Pharisees respond to Jesus, saying in verse 13, quote, The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Unquote. Here, the Pharisees ignore the clear truth of Jesus' declaration and defer to an objection based upon a technicality of Jewish law. In this case, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15 states, quote, One witness shall not rise up against a man for an iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established, unquote. In other words, from the perspective of the Pharisees, Jesus was making the above declaration by himself 
without any other witnesses who could verify his claim. As a result, the Pharisees were free to reject Jesus' claim on that basis. While the Pharisees thought they had a closing argument which would shut Jesus down, Jesus effectively refutes the Pharisees in verses 14 through 18. Quote, Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me." Unquote. So, essentially, Jesus reveals to the Pharisees that he is not alone. Theologically speaking, Jesus as, quote, I am, unquote, ego I may, is God. God is a triune being consisting of God the Father, God the Son, i.e. Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, blessed God, three in one. Therefore, as Jesus points out, God, the Father who sent his Son, Jesus, bears witness to what Jesus is saying because the two are one in being, nature, and purpose. While it is not stated here, technically Jesus had three witnesses because the Holy Spirit also bears witness to him. Consequently, Jesus' revelation of himself as I am is valid and true and fulfills the criteria of Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. In both verses, 19 through 22, Jesus and the Pharisees exchange comments, saying, quote, then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then the, said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. Unquote. The Pharisees, who were clearly on a shallow level, thought that Jesus was talking about an earthly father. But Jesus had no earthly father. Jesus is God incarnate in the flesh. This is a realization and understanding which is only possible by an act of God's grace upon the heart of those whom God chooses. If, in fact, we are drawn by God's grace to a saving relationship with Christ, then we will know Jesus as Lord, as God, and as I am. To know one is to know both, because both are one. These Pharisees truly did not know God, or minimally their eyes were blind to the truth. The truth was and is that Jesus is the Messiah and that he had come to save his people from their sins. Faithful Jews had been seeking the Messiah since Genesis 3. Jesus here predicts that these and other people would 
continue to look for the Messiah's coming and their salvation. Sadly, these and other people did not know and do not recognize Jesus as Messiah, as God, and as I am. Consequently, anyone who does not know or denies Jesus as Messiah, as God, and as I am, will die in their sins. Following in verses 23 through 24, Jesus provides explanation for this situation. Quote, And he said unto them, As for you, from beneath you are, as for myself, from above I am. As for you, or of this world, you are. As for myself, I am not of this world. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Quote. Here, first of all, Jesus again says, quote, From above, I am, ego I may, from above I am, the existing one, the one who is, the I will exist because I will exist, I exist because I exist, I am who I am, I am that I am, I will be who I will be, or I am that which exists. The truth of the reality that opposed to all dogs go to heaven, there is, in fact, a dichotomy. There are those who begin from beneath, because like all humans who are fallen from fellowship from God due to our nature of sin, we are all worthy of death and hell due to our sin. On the other hand, there are those who, by God's sovereign grace, he chooses to draw to himself through the finished work of Christ. So, throughout history, there are those from beneath, the tares, the goats, the unregenerate, who will die in their sins, which is their nature. Then there are those who are from above, the wheat, the sheep, the born from above, the born again, who will enjoy fellowship now and eternally by virtue of what Christ has already done. Secondly, Jesus makes it very clear that the restored fellowship and life eternal in God's presence is contingent on an abiding faith and acknowledgement that Jesus is, I am. Verse 24 says, quote, For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Unquote. However, the translators do us a bit of a disservice by inserting the personal pronoun, quote unquote, he, to ostensibly help make a more grammatically correct English sentence. But the fact is that the word, quote-unquote, he, is not in the original. This changes the understanding from warning people that they will die in their sins simply because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, to dying in their sins because they refuse to believe that Jesus is I am. Jesus is God, a very God. Jesus is Ego, I may. Despite what is glaringly evident here, the Pharisees' question and Jesus' response in verses 25 through 28 tell us the following. Quote, then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to, and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, 
then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things, unquote. The Pharisees are still blind to Jesus' deity, but Jesus informs them, and anyone else who doubts his identity, that the proof will manifest when Jesus is crucified, dies, and resurrects. At that point, when Jesus is lifted up, I risen again, then there will be many who will and who do know that Jesus is, I am, ego I may. The translators again insert the word, quote unquote, he, which is not there in the original. Verse 29 and 30 close out this episode saying, quote, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Unquote. May it be by God's grace and mercy that there be those listening right now who would believe on him as I am. This concludes this episode. Please join me for episode 9. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Go to the world.